Okay, so this segment's on airspace, and uh, so there's uh, always problems with airspace, and in particular there's problems with class E and G airspace. It's a special emphasis area within a lot of the FA when they're doing uh, testing, because the reason the students don't know it is because the flight instructors don't know it. So, and we're going to see. So let's start off with what we know. What everybody knows, class alpha. 18,000 feet, it ends where? 60,000 60, feet. What's above it? Class E. C again. Right? Oh, really? Yeah. Class yeah. echo all the way to infinity. Around Mars, class echo, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Well, you know, they didn't say planet, so I think within 1,200 feet of the surface it might be glass dull. Unregulated. <laughs> right? so, okay, that's fine. So we have to record an instrument rating, instrument uh, things. So Not Neil class. Armstrong was the yeah. instrument rated clearly. Yeah. Class B. It's this blue stuff, right, which we know. It's here. It has shelves. So we say that it looks like an upside down wedding cake, which is fine. We'll just try it first. With however many shelves. They don't have to be all uh, symmetrical. They could be, but they all have different altitudes. So this is B. Uh, and then um, Class Charlie. San Jose, it's fine. It's magenta. Again, with shelves. So it's a smaller uh, segment. So it's going to look like this. Maybe only one or a few shelves. We'll really depict it this way. Typically starts at, uh, uh, ends at 4,000 feet, right? Usually, and this typically ends at 10. Um, Nowadays. Yeah. Then glass delta, right here by. Uh, Rio view, it's okay. It goes up to 2,000 feet. You see it on the chart. It's a dashed line, and so it kind of, well, I guess it looks like this. So the way I remember these to tell people is this is the upside down first wedding cake. This is the upside down <laughs> second wedding cake, and this is the upside down third wedding cake, cupcake, right? Let's just do a cupcake, okay. That's what he's going to be pricey, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's that. But this is not the way I start the airspace. This is the way I start for you, because you know. So where do I start the airspace myself? Uh, I start at the, at the very end of whatever lesson um, that's going to go before this, so depending on the student. So it could be an aerodynamics lesson. It could be whatever. But this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to tell them, I need you to write down these five things, and I need you to commit these five things to memory by the next lesson. Only five things. So these are the possibilities, the airspace possibilities. If it's because if I teach them this first, they'll never say something. I think that's four miles and uh, clear of two thousand feet. Like those, they won't say something stupid. They'll just know it's not one of the five choices. So, so the first thing I'm going to put down is uh, one mile clear of clouds, one coke. You can think of it that way. One of my students called it that once. The next one's going to be three cokes, three miles clear of clouds. Uh, the next one is going to be three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, and 2,000 feet laterally. Uh, we can remember that by three uh, Cessna 152s. Uh, the fourth one is five miles, 1,000 feet below, a thousand feet above, and one mile around. And we call that the five all ones. It's a mnemonic. And uh, finally, the last one is one mile, 500 below, a thousand above, and 2,000 laterally. And that's uh, one Cessna 152, to remember. <clears throat> so these are the five cases. There isn't any other case. So constraining it that way in the beginning sets out the cloud clearance and visibility rules. In the second lesson I'm going to only use the chart and all I'm going to do is identify airspace. I'm not going to attach any cloud clearances, visibilities to it, I'm not going to put any equipment, nothing, speed limits, nothing. It's just going to be, I'm going to point the places on the chart, train them first, 
point the place on the chart and ask them what kind of airspace they're in. And they need to parrot that back without much hesitation. When they can do it without hesitation, they know it, without minimal hesitation. So I would teach them things like, let's go to the Central Valley. I would, for, I would show them class B here, right? And I would say these altitudes are in hundreds of feet. So class B here goes from 600 to 1,000 feet. And over here it's 4,000 to uh, 10,000. And this one's surface at the airport, surface to 10,000. And if we look at the class Charlie for any one of these segments, uh, 1,500 to 4,000. And so we get that. So that's easy enough to teach the Charlie and the Bravo. And then I'll go out to the Central Valley to do the rest of it. So we'll move out over here. Okay, so this is class Delta, easy to teach because it's usually a cylinder, a circle. And it's uh, dashed cyan, goes up to 2,600 feet. And then uh, there's a couple other cases. Uh, first is when you see magenta feathered vignette shading inward. It gets lighter as it goes inward, like here. Inside of that, class uh, Echo starts at 700 feet AGL. So it, that means the airspace is class Golf, uncontrolled, until you get to 700 AGL. So, and it's above ground level. So if the, the hills go like this, then the airspace goes the same, right above ground level. Uh, outside of that, on the hard line side, of this, then uh, class echo starts at 1,200 feet. Now, how do I know that? Uh, because the legend uh, says it. And let me tell you what, how the history of this went. This helps put it in perspective. If you were flying in the mid 80s, which is where I started flying, 1984, um, that's where I parachute pants and listen to the Bee Gees. Uh, <laughs> and, and Culture Club, right? I guess, yeah, that's right. Okay, but if you were around in the 80s, you would have noticed on these charts something different. And what you would have noticed is every place they had this magenta shading going inward, they had blue feathered shading going the other way, on the other side of it. So to indicate to you that class, at the time, uncontrolled air, or whatever it was, started at 1,200 feet. But then they said that really clutters up the chart a lot, because every time we put this, we've got to put blue stuff over there, and we lose, you know, it, it starts getting cluttered, right? So what they did was they made a note on the chart. And the note on the chart says Class E airspace exists at 1,200 feet unless otherwise designated above in the legend. So if it's not designated any other way, it starts at 1,200 feet. So I don't know if the legend is on this chart. I don't know if they publish it here. I think they just chop it. So what I think what you can do... We can go to the chart supplement. Okay. Match, no, no. So if you go to um, map, map touch action, go to your settings. Mm -hmm. okay, like well, the, 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 the settings on the top. Where is it? The gear. The gear. Yeah, okay, the, I got it. No, wheel. Okay, if you touch that and you go down to say map touch action, and then you say bring chart to front of the legends, then you get. Oh, this the, other one, sorry. Let's do that. I didn't see this right again. The last one, I think. Yeah, yeah it's the last one. Yeah. Okay. Third yeah, one. Yeah, there the you go. And then, so if you touch it, then you get your legends there on the side. So the, it's actually. On the section. side? Oh, yeah, where, the, where it is. Oh, in the I see it's section. here. I see it's here. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's a new feature. I don't know about that. Okay, so let's look here. So then you can see it's right here. This is the chart legend. Class E airspace exists at 1,200 feet AGL unless otherwise designated as shown above. So then these are the ways that they could designate it otherwise. Another confusing part is, is this. So if I show people this and ask them what that means, they'll say that means Class E exists at 1,200 feet AGL. And that's the end of it. But it's more than that. Class E exists uh, with a floor of 1,200 feet or greater. Could be more than that. Above the ground that laterally abuts Class G airspace. That's a really important part. To, to, because the words there aren't, aren't, aren't talking to you, right? <clears throat> Here's what it means. You're only going to see that shading if on this side, the hard side of the shading, there's Class Golf from the surface to 14,500 feet. There's no Golf above 14.5. So it means they're only going to show you that if there's class G on the other side that starts at the surface and goes all the way to 14,500 feet. Otherwise, this node on the chart takes care of it any, it would have taken care of it. So let's move over and see what this means. So let's move all the way over here. So here's some class echo with a floor of 700 feet, AGL. 
and over here is 1200 because there's nothing else to indicate that it isn't otherwise. Um, another way of justifying why this is true, because students sometimes have a little trouble with it, is you say, what are these things? These things are airways. Our airways, what class airspace? They're class echo. They start at typically 1,200 feet and they go to 18,000 feet, right? And they're four miles wide. If this was golf in here, they would have had to build a channel with that around it to make it class echo. But because they didn't, it implies this class echo there anyway to begin with. That's just another like tool, right? To get it in people's heads. So, so let's. So yeah. before you had GPS, mm -hmm. how do you know you're going to the Magenta area? Just your approximation of it. Fortunately, the rules don't. The only thing that changes is cloud clearance and visibilities, maybe, but there's no regulatory requirement for communications. So let's look well, over here. Well, yeah. Actually, but one's controlled and one's uncontrolled. So for IFR. Yeah. For yeah. Mm -hmm. No, IFR, you don't care about the cloud uh, requirements, right? Well, you can't operate IFR and control this space without a clearance. Yeah. Sure. So, so then it would tell oh, you I what see. altitude. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting one control. that you mention it because uh, most country, for this country, the, the called the transition altitude, the altitude at which you uh, class golf becomes echo, is either 700 or 1200 feet typically. But in most of Europe, it's way higher than that. So in England, it's typically 3,000 foot. So it means I can operate IFR in class G below 3,000 feet and did it pretty much every day. I would fly IFR not talking to anybody. So radar service, I get a radar service, but I have to take care of my own clearances through airspace and this and that to, to, uh, to do it. And I just dead reckon or I would pick up VORs and go around in the clouds, right? Uh, because I didn't need to have, but here it doesn't work because there's granite, there's big mountains. In the southeast of England, there's the Wells Mass. That's all there is to hit. You know, it's... Uh, 800 foot above the ground, if you're higher than that, you're, you're, you're good all the way around for a long way. So, um, it's interesting also there, uh, they, use, they don't use class B. And in England there's no class C either. But uh, they love using class A, love it. All airways are class alpha. So there's a channel you see on the chart. So you can't just join an airway, you can't fly through one of these. It'll be class A, you gotta get below it. The other thing is if they want you to stay out, like around London, London TMA, it's class alpha to surface. The only way you get in there is an IFR plan. So there are different ways of precluding you. But let's look at these special, a couple of these nice special cases. Do all airports have controlled airspace around them? No, non-towered. No, non-towered airports like this one is a Bishop, right? This is a Bishop Airport. It's a magenta. But it has class E, which is. It, this has yeah. This has class E to the surface right. because of this ticked magenta line. Well, I guess my real that. question is, is, do all airports have class E no, or around above? Around no, them? we can look at that, right? So there will be an example of that. Like here's one. Okay. So that's it doesn't have anything. That's, that's, yeah, so that's it. And either small places. So that's going to have class uh, echo airspace starting at 1,200 feet AGO. How do I know it? Because there's nothing else that would tell me it isn't. So but some let, of the smaller uncontrolled airports, what's the reason for having class E? Like for here? Or? That's for an instrument approach. It's to allow the keep the pilots on the ground from launching, uh, if because most non-precision approaches typically about 800 feet or so, so they're going to bring this down to 700. So the chances of you flying out of a cloud and seeing a VFR pilot aren't going to be too high. So the configuration of each of the like, yeah. All so those this is the instrument approach, like right here. This is the final approach course, that keyhole thing. So this may mean over here that it's circled land, uh, or that it has. Uh, maybe from two or three more different ways, it could be. And if they need to constrain any of the lower, they'll drop E to the ground, which they did here at Bishop. But now have a look here. We said 1,200 feet or greater, this blue shading event. So here's a case where we have the blue shading, and you have this zippered line, like a little zipper. And you have whatever over here, another zippered line. So do you see the number here? This means a class echo starts at 12,500 feet. Below it is class G. Now why, we don't know, but that's the reason. On this side of the shading, which is the hard side, the only time you ever see this is if it laterally abuts class G. So this part is from the surface to 14,000 feet, until you're able to find some place where it's not, which would have another zipper line or something. So we can look here, again, shading, going that way, class echo starts at 10,500 feet. Below that's class golf. 9,700 feet in this mess over here, 7,700 here. 
There's another one down here. <clears throat> 10,500 in this thing. So um, that's what these mean. So then. On that, uh, just go back down a little bit. Yep. That uh, one 10,500, mm -hmm. that, that uh, shape on the other side of it, on the outside of it, is classical as well. Uh, no. Or well, yeah, up to, uh, but to where? Because there's no indication, right? So this is contained, that must be class E inside. On this side, I don't see anything to say it's anything other than class E exists at 1,200 feet AGL unless otherwise indicated. There's nothing there. Okay. Now, if they were feathered shading like this, well, you see maybe, well, it's really hard to see here. This might be feathered blue this way. If it is, it's still 1,200 feet. But I don't, I don't know if it's there. I don't know. I'll have to look and see a little closer. Sometimes there are state boundaries and other things that are starting to look the same. Um, so you're likely to get one of these on the test, but these are the places. So now I play the airspace game with the student, right? So I just cruise out over here and take the, the best cases first. And this is how I do it. I just say, uh, you're here at 3,500 feet on the altimeter, class echo. You're there at 500 feet, class G, surface, class G. 4,000 feet, class echo. Uh, you're here at uh, 2,500 feet on the altimeter class echo. Here at uh, 1,000 feet AGO, class golf. This is about the pace. Not not quite that fast, but they shouldn't be taking time to go like, oh, I think it's, hmm. Uh, if they're doing that, they're not ready yet. Right? They're not They're not in it. So don't leave this part until they can do that. Don't be one of the guys who writes all the airspace on the board all at one time and then says basically memorize that uh, because that's not a way to get it in the head. That's a way in the end to summarize it. Or to take that for a private pilot already student or a commercial student and say, let's revisit the airspace for the minute. That's okay, but not in the beginning. So then after we're done with that, then we're going to do this. Airspace game continues, but now we've got this to do. So I'm going to put these in the right place, right? <clears throat> so then I'll tell him, give him the lesson that below 1,200 feet AGL, is class G airspace, unless it's otherwise designated. Then there's a point that goes from 1,200 feet AGL to 10,000 MSL. And then there's the part above that, and it taps out at 14,500. Why, I wonder. Why, why would it leave, why would it echo or golf stop at 14,500? <clears throat> it's a history lesson. Radar when they first set up the airspace and there were jet aircraft operating high, they said, anything below where the jets fly aren't that important. There's not a lot going on down there, right? So we want to protect everybody above a certain altitude. Uh, what's the highest peak, Pike's Peak? 14,000 some odd feet. So if we just make the airspace 14,5, then no one's going to hit anything. We can sort of just let everybody do what they want up there. If there's no radar, it's okay. There's nothing to hit, right? So below that could be anything. But Class G stopped at 14.5. It's called the Continental Control Area. And uh, it's not, of course, it's not even talked about now, but that's the reason. So interesting, all right? So good to have a history lesson every now and then, because it makes things meaningful. Like, why did they do that? And if you could have a reason for it, like the reason they made 50 nautical miles uh, and not no landing was for these P3 guys who were like logging zero cross country time. Yeah, I have 4,000 hours in a peak airline and absolutely no cross-country time, right? What? How can that be? Yeah. I flew to Alaska every other day. But that's only no for cross ATP, right? Time. Yeah, for ATP, exactly, right. just so we read it. So now we're going to play the game where I've, I've done this, right? So, And I've taught the part about class echo airspace. There's a hard limit of 10,000 feet where the, where the speed limit changes, in which case we have to apply the new cloud clearance and visibilities which are five miles, thousand, thousand, one mile. So then I'm going to embed this, and we're going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to say right there at 3,000 feet on your altimeter. Class echo, three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, 2,000 mile below. Right there at that little airport, Eagle in the traffic pattern, 1,000 feet AGL. Class golf, one mile clear of clouds during the day. And I'm just doing the day now, just so I'm building it up, right? I'm going to say you're there at uh, 12,500 feet on your altimeter. Class echo. Five, thousand, or five miles visibility, 1,000 feet above, 1,000 feet below, one mile laterally. Um, then just we go through that, right? And then the same here. Now this is 
uh, this airport, Merced. You're there at the surface, Las Echo. Five, uh, three miles, 500 above, sorry, three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, 2,000 laterally. How about if you're there at 10,000 feet or 9,000 feet? Class Echo, same thing. How about at 14,000 feet? Class Echo, 5111. And you can even let them abbreviate after a while. As long as you know that when they say Cessna 152s, this kind of thing, what that means, and they're sure of what it means. You don't just let them say words without making sure with enough repetition that they've got what that means. Then that's a memory aid for them. That's fine. And then we go into the less complicated things, like we say, OK, you're going to operate here at 4,000 feet on our space here. Charlie. What are you going to be at below 2,500 feet? Echo. Right? How about at 1,000 feet? Depends. Golf, echo. So they should be able to start identifying this and just give the cloud clearance and visibilities right away. And then you know they're done when that happens. That's when they're beginning to use the information. And then you just need to tune it up by playing what I call the airspace game. You just point there and you give some reasonable amount of time. In the beginning, it'll be a stretch. It'll be like, um, it's this. And students are brilliant at this, of playing 50-50 with you. <laughs> and they're brilliant at convincing you they know it. When they know it for the moment, it'll be chucked out just as soon as you're gone. So for example, they'll say, you say, okay, right uh, there, a thousand feet. They'll be like, um, I think it's, um, is it, um, is it the one or three? And then you want to say so badly because you're on their side to go, it's class. And you go like, I think it's, it's either G. And you go like, and you go like, it's echo, 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 it's echo. And then they start doing that. And then after they say, okay, they got it. They don't have it yet. They don't have it until they say it unprovoked, unresponsed. Then they've got it. Up until then, we're not done with this game yet. It doesn't mean we have to continue browbeating them that day, but it means that we have to continue on with the exercise until it's over. And that may take several times, more than several times. But they love doing that. They love trying to convince you they know when they don't know, because they don't want to They want to move on past this. Can't we just go fly? <clears throat> Can't we just do that right now? Why are we sitting here doing this? Yeah. Getting the buy-in and the Especially with the weather, you get a lot of pushback from that. Isn't there a better way to do the weather? Yes. There's way better ways to do the weather. Why, why are we, because the market is only three million people worldwide. That's why, there's no market for this. There's no money in it. No one's gonna do it, right? Or they do it over time. And the government's finally getting their act together with being able to do better presentation of weather charts, which we're gonna see in the class. But that took forever, and it's still not done. Right? But there's no money in it. No one's taking those old coded reports and parsing data. You'll do it one time, and then you'll do it, and you'll leave it. Right? You won't support it. You're not going to be the guy answering the phone going, like, yeah, I guess it blew up to that. You're just going to leave do it for fun. But the, so for someone to do it for real, there's got to be some cash in it. Right? And there's no money in this. So there's that. And all, everybody going through certification at the higher levels already know the coded stuff. So there's no momentum to change it yet. Right? So we'll, we'll get there. We will get there. It's just like most things in aviation. It's going to take a while. We seem to get the avionics like moved ahead, uh, way ahead of the airframe and the engine, right? So this is where um, the airspace goes and where it stays. And that's the difference between class E and G. And so now we need to look at uh, the case where we have uh, this one. So this comes up on a flight test, so it might be interesting to say. Show me on the chart where you can operate. Uh, this is the minimum. One mile. 500 above, 1,000 above, and 2,000 laterally. So where is that case? So we know that below uh, 1,200 feet, it's uh, one mile clear of clouds. Yeah? And within class G, between 1,200 AGL and 10,000 AGL, that's the case. That's the only case. This is, uh, and we all said just during the day, so we talked about night, which we're almost done. So the only place we can do that is over where we were. So here's class golf starting from the surface to 12,500 feet. So let's take a look at the ground. It's 3,000 feet right there, right? You see it? 3,000 3, feet right there. So between 3,000 feet and 4,200 feet, just below that, I can be one mile clear of clouds, right? Because that's below 1,200 HEL. So far, so good. If I'm above that, let's say I'm at 6,000 feet. Now I'm 
3,000 feet AGL. I'm more than 1,200 and less than 10,000, I can use that. All right, on this hard side of the blue shading over here, this is surface to 14.5. So if I'm here, which is over a pretty low ground, less than 1,000 feet, between 300, 400, and then 1,200 above that, it's a mile per clouds. Above that, up to 10,000 MSL, one mile, 500 below 1,000 and 2,000. What about there at uh, 12,000 feet on my altimeter? Now it's G still, but we're above 10,000, right? So it's 5111. Anything above 10 is 5,000 feet above 1,000 and a mile lateral, no matter. So that's a nice thing to know. Above 10, it's 5 all ones. Now let's look at night. What's the only airspace that changes day or night? Golf. Golf. Golf is the only airspace that changes day or night. So the trick question, if you're in class echo airspace, like over, I don't know, over there, wherever it is, and, it's, and it starts at uh, 3,000 feet, you know, what, how about 6,000 feet? You say, okay, I'm in echo. What about night? Uh, the cloud cloud, it's like three, is it five? Then? Don't get confused. It's only golf that changes. So golf will change like this. One mile clear of clouds changes to three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, and 2,000 laterally. Between 1,200 and 10,000, three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, 2,000 laterally. Above 10,000, five, 1,000, same as it always is, 1,000 or mile. So that's what it changes to at night. Now there's one exception. It's in this area. Does anybody know the exception? Don't have to. It's one exception to the night flying rule. We did like half a mile of a runway. Within the half mile of the runway at night in the traffic pattern, it's back to one mile per clouds. That's the only exception. Okay. MOA, special use airspace. Here's an MOA. I know it because it says MOA. Uh, is it required us to have a clearance to fly through the area? Do we have to talk to anybody, establish communications? No, nothing. So where we find information about if that MOA is active? It's usually, it's usually like a frequency. Yeah, usually the top, the top part of the sectional. It's in, a, it's in an area above the legend on the top. Or another one. Yeah, if it's, it can be in an odom too, if it's... That's why it might be active. The controllers would know like, when it is active. Mm -hmm. And it would say in the legend, or by an odom. I see. Yeah. So uh, it's not in this legend, it's in the one that's usually at the top of the section. But we can also look in the chart supplements, which is now the, was before the airport facilities directory, it'll have it. How about this area here? Like uh, this one, can we operate there? It depends. It depends. Uh, if we have a specific ATC clearance, yes. If we don't, no. Basically, the short answer, right? People will say, well, if it's not active, well, if it's not active, it's not a restricted area, then, right? So it's only when it's active that you have to worry about it. Then that's again in the in the chart supplements or the top of the chart. You'll see it. Um, so what's the difference between, I mean, I know, like, MOA and restricted area is the same thing, isn't it? No. no. Oh, the no, activity no. that's going on is different. Restricted area, you have to have an ATC clearance to operate, oh, and see. MOA you don't. Oh, okay. And the type of things going on may be, may be different. So um, how about an alert area? Just be alert. <laughs> be very alert. Where, where are we at? Plus China Lake, okay. Vegas, basically. So let's go up here. Just so want Travis. Yeah. yeah, that's where we're going. <laughs> right there. <laughs> this one. How do you know it's an alert area? It starts with an A. It looks like an MOA, but then it starts with an A, so it's an alert area. It used to be blue. Yeah, they changed those, which is good. They change it the more you can fly. You don't have, it's just areas of intense training. Right? So in that case, you just need to, uh, to remain clear if you uh, avoid the traffic. Uh, but there's no preclusion for me to be in it. Uh, you see, this is a class delta. 
and on Travis, but it has this little stub sticking out here. What is that? Class C extension. To the surface. Yep. Yeah, same as it was around the airport. It's just there. That's it. It's protecting an instrument approach coming into that. That's what it's doing. Yeah. Okay. On the coast, what are these? Warning areas. Can you fly in those? Sure. Can. Um, no, that's not recommended usually. I tried to do that in Florida to cut the corner and go down because I had a multi engine airplane. I wanted to. I said, uh, you can do it, but we wouldn't advise you to do it. We don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm not to it. I'll stay out of there. Uh, you know what the 8 is? is? This thing? It's the border U.S. airspace. Right? Clear customs when you cross, right? Yeah. Is that it? Let's see. Uh, and then entry requirements. So Class Echo doesn't require any entry requirements, nor does Golf. Um, the entry requirements for Delta is to establish two-way communications and maintain. So what does it mean? Repack the tail number. Mostly. There's more to it than that at the CFI level. But you're right. That's what we would say as pilots. So it's a two-way two communication. So we have to say the facility name and our tail sign, call sign. And then they come back with the facility and our call sign and the facility to make sure we got the right place. Okay. So Travis approach. Cessna 1234, then do that, and then it's Cessna 1234, Travis approach. That's the two-way part. Uh, so what if they read back your tail number incorrectly? Then you should, oh, good question for you. Uh, uh, Clarify. You should correct them. Yeah, you should correct them. If they read it, I guess I haven't said I'm a controller. Oh, yeah. we're one center, so. So if they read back your call sign incorrectly, it's not a clearance for you. For, it meant for you. Then yes. say that's a fact. Yeah. yeah. So chances are. So but, saying like, hey, did you mean? Right. Yes. Like, yeah, but, but if it's really, I don't know, if it's really on the hairy edge there, and I think it's for me, and there was no other aircraft sounding like that, I'd probably, I'd go in, then I'd correct it later. Yeah. But to be absolute safest, you probably do it before you went in, right? Yeah. yeah. How about for class B? You need explicit clearance. Right? You need explicit clearance, right? You still need to establish communications and to get a specific clearance. So is a squawk code a clearance? No. They say swap one, two, three, four. No. So what does a clearance mean? Clear. clear to enter. Yeah. When when the specific when you have a clearance, when it's cleared into, cleared to do something, that's a clearance, right? If it's just a report on station, then you get a clearance. Well, that's not very good. Or uh, how about heading two one zero for a little bit? Maybe getting you ready for the next sector, and then you like happen the French guy up here. They he's coming from San Francisco, doing a bay tour thing, and so they told they gave him a swap code. And they told him, you know, expect uh, this next frequency in a few minutes. And they told him switch, he didn't hear it. And so then uh, then he gets ready to switch, and he said, oh, there's this, there's Golden Gate Park and all this. In the meantime, right into the B surface area he goes. And he thinks he's got clearance because he has a squat code, see? That's not the case, right? So they were just getting him ready, primed for the next guy who was going to clear him or do something different with him. But that's not his sector, he doesn't know, right? He didn't, he didn't command that part. So, and you work with center. I work at the center, yeah. Okay. Just to not trach on. No. Oh. Center? Open center? Mm -hmm. oh. I work in the like uh, in north area, so it's like half high altitude, departures going east, airspace high altitude over Reno, mm -hmm. and then half uh, low altitude, so sectors like 40 and 41 over Napa, Santa Rosa, mm -hmm. that area, and then 42 over like Red Angel, Chico, Red Bluff. Okay, that that's a pretty thing here, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the requirements to enter. Now, do you need a transponder to operate within Class Bravo airspace? Say yes. Yes. How about above it? Yeah. Hell yes. It's above 10,000 feet. Uh, so Class B, uh, uh, the altitude typically of Class B is up to 10,000. Above that, it's echo. And above 10,000 feet in echo, you need a transponder, right? How about uh, below Class B? Yeah. Yeah. The veil. yeah, there's the veil, and even if there's not, parts of it that stick out maybe, you need it uh, in places. Uh, what about in class charter? In it? Everybody says yes? Yep. Yes, that's correct. How about above it? Yes. It's just required above it. How about below it? Negative. So, so I don't I don't understand that part. So on? without the transponder, you don't know what altitude you're right. operating at. So you could be operating above and turn off your transponder, and later when they get you, say, no, 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 it's below, and how can they tell? They can't. 
So I think it's an idiotic rule. On primary radar, they can't tell. Yeah, okay, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's just a blip, right? Yeah, so I don't understand that rule at all. They should require it within the lateral boundaries so that they can tell you where you are. Right? But, the, you know, the, what happens a lot of times is there's, uh, when the airspace is being talked about or redesignated, like when we started talking about this a long time ago, this used to be called ASRs, Airport Service Radar Areas, this thing, and they were the equivalent of Class Charlie, voluntary at the time to participate in. Uh, but they talked about them, and some certain operators said, well, you know, we're right below the shelf of this Class Charlie. We have this operation that is like a helicopter just goes here and tours, and we don't really want to have a transponder, right? So they negotiate that crap out. And so then it becomes something for us to know more about when it's like, why? Why do we have to be below there? Sometimes there are those kind of things that go on that we, we're just not privy to. Like I can tell you my input into Class Charlie, my sole input, me and Amelia Reed from who's I used to own Amelia Reed Aviation. Do you see how the Class Charlie is curved here yeah. along the road? It didn't yeah. start off that way. Yeah. It started off with being a circle. Yeah. And then we said, hey, in order for us to get relief to be able to leave Reed Hillviewer, be able to go up and down that side, can't you just border it on the highway? Because if you do that, we'll have a corridor there that we can stretch through rather than going all the way. And so they did that. So th that was by negotiation, right? Just by saying, yeah, that makes sense to do. We can do that, you know, okay. Easy to see the road. Yeah, very easy. Yeah. So that was that was it, right? So those kind of things. Um, okay. So we'll uh, talk about special VFR. That's another last area that is a little confusing in some cases. So when can you get special VFR? When the, when the weather is below the minima for um, Delta. Okay. So he's he's going to make that case, which is fine. It's correct. Part. So when the weather is below basic VFR weather rooms, which means what to you? What is basic VFR? 3-1. Nope. It's a mi uh, 3 miles and a 1,000 foot ceiling. So when the weather is below that, the field is considered IFR. You can't get special VFR if the ceiling were 1,100 feet as bad as you wanted. You just can't give it to you because the weather is VFR. But you still have to operate 500 below, which may be a problem. Right? We'll see about that. That's a different thing. So you can get special VFR, are you, now listen to these words, in controlled airspace where controlled airspace goes to the surface around an airport. Yeah. So in your first example, Palo Alto, around out here, it's right. Yeah, because it's cold, right? Yeah, but have a look here. And then you only need to be one mile clear of clouds. At night you have to have an instrument rating, same requirements. What kind of airspace is around Merced? Okay. So Class E, going to the ground. You can get special VFR here. Because it's controlled airspace that goes to the ground around an airport. Who would you get it from? You get it from, uh, who do you guys give it? From uh, NorCal. Yeah, yeah okay. from NorCal. Yeah. In this case, NorCal. Yeah. yeah. Now, have a look in this case. Let's say we wanted to go from Castle right here over to Gustine, which is over here. And let's say that uh, it's two miles of visibility everywhere. How could we do that? So, so we fire the Castle? And then stay below 700? Yeah. And below 1200. But cool. well, we couldn't get special VFR out here because controlled airspace doesn't go to the surface around an airport. You can only get special VFR when controlled airspace goes to the surface around an airport. Controlled airspace can be B, C, D, E. Just not G. Right? So that's the area that comes up sometimes. And it's true. Special VFR. And so some would say uh, when when the weather, like, it's good use of special VFR here sometimes because it'll be clear, we can see over there, just here, we'll get special VFR to leave. And if we still can't see over there, we would go very special VFR over there, right? So the tower is not an operation at Castle. Right. Um, it is. Class D becomes E or G. Right? Yeah, depending and on what the chart supplements the LAFD says. The AFD is where you look, right? Mm -hmm. But so it's if not it becomes G, something. then it's, it's Doesn't matter. not controlled, but if it becomes E, then it's controlled. Yes. So, uh, so on that was the, uh, so the, ch the airport facilities directory has been renamed to the chart supplements. So oh. it, on the outside of the cover, it says chart supplements. Inside is the AFD, but on the outside, it says chart supplements. What makes you think that? That was to help align with the AAIC, which are ICAO for the airport information uh, that, that's co collated for each airport internationally. It was built to more conform to the name. When did it happen? It happened uh, two months ago. Okay. Very short. Okay. Hey, uh, Mike, so now since you mentioned Reed Hillview and Class Charlie, yeah. I actually have a question. Okay. So if you look at it, 
look at it. Um, right next to the runway. Can you zoom in? Yeah. Like right there. You see uh, the, the thick magenta line is on yeah. this side of the highway? Yeah. And then it's on the other side of the highway. But first of all, that's the, is the magenta line the Class thick, Charlie? The thick magenta line is Class Charlie. Okay, so it includes, um, that, that means the pixels that are purple are Class Charlie as well. The, the, the dash lines? The dash lines are Class Echo. No, 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 no. So, so there's a thick magenta line. These right? are Class Charlie. Yeah, including, including, including the, the magenta line. Yeah, including the magenta So it kind of comes in a little bit next to the runway. Yeah. And then so, it goes back to the other side of the highway. Why is that? It's only, so they would tell you, it's, on the chart you could read it that way, but when you think about how the chart is made digitally, the color is just there to help you identify where the boundary is, but the actual boundary itself is an infinitesimally small line that defines some, some data points, right? The only reason that we see the line being big is because yeah. we need it to be able to see it with our eyes. Yeah. The airspace isn't necessarily that big. Okay, so, but, but the line is, okay so is the line going through the middle of the magenta line? or the We don't know. I don't, we know. don't know. I see. We can ask them. We have had errors where there were, like you would see like over here before, right. and we had these questions. I'll show you something that, yeah. that happened. Catch up, please. Where the Class C veil didn't sit directly on top of the edge of the, the end of the Class Bravo for San Francisco. So in a few charts ago, some number of charts ago, you see the veil that's here? It didn't ride like that. It was it was kind of offset. It was a circle that was offset, and it was just a registration error in the printing. So we called them and said, "Oh, that's a registration error." You want to see another charting error? That's before I bring up sixty. Yeah, okay, that. You know what the circle means around these airports? A little circle. M O E. It means it excludes the airspace below. But notice that it's not centered over the airport. It's centered over the town. The MOA, there's no reason to exclude the MOA over the town. You want to exclude it over the airport so you can operate, right? That circle should be over the airport. Right? There's no real reason no, no reason to do it this way. So there you go. And that's been on the chart for a long time. Uh, what's a terse sub? I'll tell Jeff, we'll get it first. <laughs> terse sub. No, no takers on the terse sub? Terminal uh, service radar area. Yeah. Radar service area. There's only a few of them around the country. The one around Fargo, right? Yeah, and uh, it's around Palm Springs, one the closest one. Huh? Oh no, what am I doing to her? So this was. It's not there for Yeah, that's what's going on. Get your brain engaged here. Uh, we want PSP. Tursas are voluntary, they don't require uh, a clearance or anything else, but they look like this. Do you see the black lines? They look like plastic. Right here? The black ones. Those surface to 10,000 feet here, 2,000 feet. You can get a radar service there. Uh, it's interesting, the um, Stockton has radar cover, good radar cover, right? By NorCal. And they could do a similar thing and say it's available in this service here. I don't know why they do it this way. These are left over from a long time ago. There's some in Beaumont, Texas, some up in Michigan. There, many, there's, there's 12 or so. There's not so many. But they're good test question fodder, right? Have you really got yourself into the airspace far enough? I mean, there's no, there's no, as you say, it's voluntary. It's, it's yeah, it's voluntary. This is yeah, but there's class delta that you would have to participate in, right? Which is the this section here. But I mean, the service is not, not the small. It's like an approach chart that says radar required, right? No, so no, no. what's, um, it's like it just to provide a radar service. service maybe? Yeah, to provide a radar service to you, that's it. My understanding is that it's like the controllers have specific requirements to separate planes differently depending on the like category of uh, like airspace. Uh -huh. So in Charlie, they can separate them differently than um, like an Echo. Well, BFRs, the IFR separation is always the same everywhere, but uh, BFR separation. So like in Tursas, the BFR separation is the same for participating aircraft as it is in Charlie. Oh, so you can fly so through non-participating and do whatever you want. But if you are getting flight following, then they're going to separate you. Like, like and you have to follow what they say. And you, yeah, well, like, you have to do that no matter where you are. You have to, if you have an even if you're instruction. flight following in golf airspace and the yeah. controller tells you to do something, you have to do it. You can say, I'm just going to squawk VFR and then do whatever you want. But exactly. if the controller tells you to do something, you have to do it. Okay, we're up on the break. Um, we're going to do uh, another interesting part the airman certification standards next.